the scripture reading today, of course, is the story of Pentecost, the 50th day after Jesus' resurrection, when a Holy Spirit uh, when a Holy Spirit fills Jesus' followers, the church is born. In Jewish tradition, Pentecost was an important spring harvest festival, as well as a day to celebrate the gift of the law of Moses. It was, it was therefore a day of both physical and spiritual nourishment. Be because the Jews had often been conquered by other nations and forced to leave their homes and their homeland by armies or by poverty, there were, in the days of Jesus, Jews living far and wide around the world. They spoke the language of their new homes and took on new customs and traditions, but still remained faithful to God. When they would, they traveled to Jerusalem for major festivals like Pentecost. And thus, when the Holy Spirit rained down on the disciples, there were those Jews from all over the world that were there to see and hear what happened. From the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came around a sound like the rush of a turbulent wind, and it would fill the whole house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled by a Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit had gave them that ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And as, as this turbulence began, the crowd gathered and was confused, because each of them, one heard, speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astounded, they asked, all of these who are speaking in for, are from Galilee aren't, Galilee, aren't they? Then how is it that each of us hear what they are saying in their own native language? People from Iran, Medea, Elam, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phyrega, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from both Rome, both Jew Jews and converts, and the people from Crete and Arabia, in their own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and totally confused, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are full of sweet new wine. But Peter, standing with them, uh, with the 11, raised his voice and addressed them. People of Judea, all who lived in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen up. Indeed, these were the people who are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken throughout the prophet Joel. In his last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour forth my spirit upon the flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, shall prophesy, and your young people shall dream dreams. Even upon slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour faith from the spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven and signs above earth below, blood and, and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the advent of the great and replacent day of the Lord. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thanks be to God for these words of life. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, he's trying to help me. Birthday, dear church. Happy birthday to you. That's right. This is your birthday. That's what we call the day of Pentecost, right? The birthday of the church. But OMG, it was a rough pregnancy. In a way, I kind of love, given the gender-bending imagery of it, the church was nurtured in the womb of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The 12 disciples could be considered the embryo of the early church, so it was a pregnancy full of trauma and disappointment. When Jesus was alive and teaching them, the 12 disciples generally didn't have a clue what he was talking about. When his death came near, they all forsook him and fled. When he was executed, they were nowhere to be seen. When he was raised, they didn't believe it. 
When he appeared to them, they didn't recognize him. When he ascended into heaven, they had no idea what to do next. And yet, in the crazy way of God, through all that trauma, trouble, and failure, the church was indeed born into the world whole and healthy on this beautiful day of Pentecost. So by one calculation, this is the 1,992nd anniversary of the birth of the church. So give it up, people. Right? What comes before part B? Partay! <laughs> Grant, Grant can't believe I went there. Learned that from my daughter when she was about eight, and uh, I still love it. You know, thanks be to God. So actually, um, to be fair, though, I could just as well call for a much um, less positive response. For although it got off to a beautiful start 1,992 years ago with a vibrant spirit, courageous faith and deep and abiding love, still there have been a lot of turbulent years. The low lights of the life of the church include slaughtering Jews and Muslims, burning heretics at the stake, subordinating women to men, enabling genocide, condemning gay and lesbian people, sustaining a system of white supremacy that made the people of Africa subhuman and mere property to be bought and sold, filling generation upon generation of people with guilt and the fear of hell as if God were not love. Yeah, so maybe our 1992nd birthday observance is complicated. Indeed, it's a miracle that we have seven young people today and four adults who actually want to become part of this thing that we call the church. I guess the reason they do is because those terrible lowlights don't define us. Although, the, I, I wonder how many of you will remember this scene or get this reference. Although the Katie Holmes character, and this is the only time I will ever quote anything Katie Holmes says, the Katie Holmes character in Batman Begins spoke a great truth it's not who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you. In spite of the fact that I believe that, still, the church is more than these lowlights. I do worry about how that more comes across, though, sometimes. Especially how it comes across to you young people. If you're one of the seven being confirmed today, raise your hand real high so that other people can see you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven's around here somewhere. All right. I worry about how that comes across to you young people and others. What I mean is, what we do here looks so respectable. This church has a lovely building. We keep the grass cut and uh, there's beautiful mulch in the flower beds. People generally act pretty civilized around here and I think uh, even Grant controls his potty mouth when you guys are around. At least, I think he does. Our worship service are pretty orderly. 
And while our music, both the organ inside and this incredible band and the singers outside and at other times, although, yeah, <laughs> although it is always beautiful and touching, it's not exactly edgy, I wouldn't say. Most, if not all, of you young people, those being confirmed, most of you have been in Christmas pageants around here where you were adorable. You have been in children's choirs where you were adorable. You uh, probably made crafts in Sunday school or in VBS that were adorable. And so I and other preachers have stood up here, well, stood in there and preached about God's love and the way of Jesus and being generous and loving other people. And I would imagine that in the years of a young person, it has all seemed very, well, comforting, maybe at best or maybe more like tame, or, God forbid, it may have seemed uninteresting. But Ethan, Peter, Cooper, Betsy, Vivian, Haley, and Juliana, we've been hiding something from you. The truth is that we, the church, are a bunch of crazy, radical, outrageous people. And together as the church, we are here to mess things up. Now I offer as proof today three examples of this. I know a member of the church who owns a company that makes parts for high-tech devices. F super fine technical components that might go in a cell phone or maybe the drivetrain of a Tesla. A few years ago, some guys called up this man to see if he could make a part that they were trying to produce. He agreed to meet with them to discuss the particulars, and in the course of that meeting, it became clear that what they were asking him to do was make part of the trigger assembly of landmines. Now, this was a weapons company that supplied the government with means to go to war. Now, several of us from church have been to Angola, which uh, not, long ago, not that long ago fought a civil war. And at that time, they had more landmines in the ground than any other nation on earth. Prince Harry, in fact, uh, Prince Harry, he's that redheaded guy who's married to Meghan Markle. Maybe you know him. He was just in Angola a couple of years ago, in fact, celebrating the progress that Angola has made. Um, in, in removing the landmines, but by that time it was too late for a lot of people. It is not unusual at all to this day to see people walking around in Angola with one leg, the other one blown off when they stepped on a landmine while going out to get water or to collect firewood to cook dinner. And they, of course, are the lucky ones. This church member realized what a terrible, torturous thing landmines are. So he refused to build that little part of the trigger assembly. The truth is that he would have made a lot of money with that job. But at church, he learned the radical little idea that we are supposed to love our enemies. And he couldn't square that with the building of landmines. 
that's the kind of thing the church is really all about. That's the kind of thing that happens when the Holy Spirit rains down. Another example. There's a woman who's part of this church who is a nurse and that in and of itself is an amazing radical thing because nurses are some of the strongest, caringest people around. But this woman was particularly feisty. Now, you, you, you kids, you young people being confirmed today, you're old enough to realize that there is such a thing as sexual harassment. It takes different forms. But one common type is men taking advantage of their professional or economic power over women. Well, one day this nurse was doing some training with a male doctor, learning a new procedure that she needed to do. And the doctor reached around from behind her and began to press himself against her in a most unwanted way, if you know what I mean. Well, this nurse grew up in a church family, and she learned that people ought to treat others with respect, and that women don't have to put up with crap from men. So she got, remember he was wrapped around her from behind, she got her foot between his legs and bleh, gave him a nice kick where it hurt a heck of a lot. And the doctor screamed in pain and let go of her. And he never bothered her again. Now, it could have turned out differently. The truth is that she could well have lost her job. But at church, she learned the radical little idea that women are strong and dignity is more important than money. That's the kind of thing the church is really all about. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit rains down. Another example, maybe a little closer to home for those of you being confirmed today. You probably know that there are a lot of high schoolers in this town who drink alcohol, sometimes excessively. You probably also know that high schoolers like to have friends. And it's not uncommon for drinking and friends to go together. Now, I don't know how big of a secret it is, but you probably remember a year or so ago when everybody's lives changed dramatically as the pandemic made it unsafe to gather in large groups, even in groups of family members outside of your home and your friends? Well, truth be told, that didn't stop a lot of high schoolers in this town from getting together for parties in basements with lots of alcohol. Well, one of our high schoolers here at church said, no. That's not right. And because both, both because she doesn't drink and because ragers during the pandemic are not okay, she was even more distanced from her social circle than she otherwise would have been. And that's not fun. The truth is, she could have had more friends if she drank. She could have been closer to her friends if she went to those ragers during the pandemic, but she learned in her family and in our youth group here at church that there is a better way, the way of health for yourself and for others, the way of substantive friendships, the way of not just going along with the crowd. That's the kind of thing the church is really all about. That's the kind of thing that happens when the Holy Spirit rains down. So, confirmands, 
we here at Union Church and the much bigger, broader, beautiful global church, we may look tame and, God forbid, uninteresting. But when you think about the amazing things that people do to follow Jesus, to be the church in the world today, and even right here at Union Church, you'll see that with the promises you are about to make in becoming part of the church on this, our 1,992nd birthday, you are doing something different, something amazing, even something radical. You are giving yourself to be a follower of Jesus as his own, to love and serve him faithfully all the days of your lives. And that is what this different, different, amazing, radical church is all about. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit rains down. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.